start? Thank you. Wow. <laughs> Talk about it, yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> and um, so, a couple of things that I need to say or I want to say she has received numerous, a lot of young faculty career best paper awards. Um, that, as a like junior faculty, I wish to receive or hope to receive one day. That's why she's a big, big role model idol for me and people like me in, in this field. And um, I want to mention just two of them because one of them. Actually, both of them are very recent. Um, she was named um, 2019 Fellow in the American Society of Medical Engineers recently. And the second one was, um, she was named one of the 50 bad at <laughs> um, <laughs> the uh, and Mary <laughs> Thank you. Yes, of all the awards I've ever gotten in my life, the 50 Badass Women in InStyle is the one my family and friends appreciate the most. Um, and InStyle is not the magazine I ever would have pictured for myself as a kid as well. So uh, that, was, that was interesting. All right, so today I want to talk to you a little bit about um, what I am calling microsystems-inspired robotics. We have all sorts of different inspiration for robotics. Um, and, and for me, one of the inspirations is in microsystems. Um, but obviously, there's a lot of interesting biology in there as well. And so, actually, if you go back in the literature, and I'm a bit of, of a history buff when it comes to science and technology, um, robotics has always inspired microsystems. So if you go back to the first, microsystems is another word for MEMS, microelectromechanical systems. If you go back into the kind of very start of MEMS in the, in the 1980s and such, it's a lot of the original inspiration. The first MEMS conference was in fact sponsored by the Robotics and Automation Society and IEEE. So Richard Feynman was mentioning robots in his uh, famous lecture, There's Plenty of Room at the Bottom. He was talking about tiny hands building tiny hands building tiny hands. Um, Anita Flynn uh, started thinking about this in the 1980s and NAT robots. If I could make tiny sensors and tiny motors and tiny circuits and tiny power supplies, I could make something the size of a NAT that could fly around. Um, and, and then, like I said, the kind of first workshop was, was sponsored by RAS. Um, I think, in some sense, microsystems has already, to some degree, revolutionized parts of robotics, right? So this quad rotor right here is enabled to a large degree by this tiny chip. Right? This is the inertial sensor on the quad rotor, which you know, in many cases, like this one I believe is a nine axis, so it's got three axis gyro, three axis accelerometer, three axis magnetometer, all micro-engineered uh, systems, all MEMS uh, sensors that went into that. So in some sense, there's been a lot of progress in this area. Um, but we haven't done this, and this is one of the things that people originally were talking about with MEMS, the idea that I could put all these small parts together and make something the size of an ant, which would be super cool, right? We also haven't done things like this. So skins, like the idea of ubiquitous sensors. That quad rotor is awesome, but it has one sensor basically on it, right? Um, skin is amazing. Uh, things that enable this moth to hover and fly and, and get nectar out of flowers. All of this is due to these ubiquitous kind of large numbers of sensors. And this is something that MEMS has the potential or the microsystems has the potential to provide, but we aren't quite there yet. And so there's a lot of really interesting existence proofs. It's one of the nice things about working in this area. People say, oh, that's going to be impossible. You're never going to be able to do that. I can just say, 
look at that ant crawling across your uh, picnic table, it is absolutely possible. So we have a lot of really interesting existence proofs of things that we can even do if we can actually uh, get robots at this size scale. And so um, plankton, spiders make their home on civil infrastructure, uh, ants can build bridges out of themselves or rafts out of themselves. Um, termites build effectively well-ventilated apartment buildings for other termites um, that can be eight meters plus high. Right? We can fly around, perch on things, all sorts of fun things that you can do. And obviously a lot of potential impact on other fields um, if you're successful in doing this as well. And so I think there's a lot of kind of fun applications out there. Um, so kind of as a uh, Zainab was get, uh, getting to kind of the lab goal or the, the goal of, of what I think of for the research in my lab is really combining this expertise in microsystems along typically with some inspiration from biology to really work on improved sensing and actuation in larger scale robots as well as really enabling robots at this tiny scale. Right? And so I think there's a lot of different projects going on. This is a sampling of them. It gets really hard as you get older to figure out what you're going to talk about um, because they're all very fun. Um, so I did not bring a stick like Greg typically brings to these. So, um, so we've done things like uh, autonomous jumping robots. And so this is looking at kind of enabling autonomy at these really small scales. In this case, it was effectively a micro rocket robot. So not as much bio inspiration in there, but chemical energy. Um, I'll talk a little bit about locomotion and small scale legged robots. Um, this is work largely by uh, Ryan St. Pierre in my group. Um, some multi-material 3D printing and design. Um, one of the projects that I, I really enjoy and love that I won't have time to talk about are these bio-inspired impulsive mechanisms, and that's something that I work on um, directly with Zainup. I'm looking at how these very high acceleration systems are able to generate these uh, uh, incredible accelerations and how we could potentially translate that to robotic systems. Um, I'll talk a little bit about sensing. So we've done a lot of work in kind of using some new materials at micro with small feature sizes to enable some sensors that um, can get us some really interesting information in a robotic system. And then we've also done uh, somewhat weird things like electroadhesives. So the idea that uh, I can um, stick to a surface by applying a voltage, basically. Um, and so the idea behind this uh, was that I could ultimately enable kind of crawling or potentially fun grasping manipulation. Um, and we have larger scale robots, large in my lab, of the size of my old tiny iPhone. Um, but, uh, you know, that can run around on bridges and the like. So, so this is kind of a general overview of this kind of topics that we work on. Um, and I'll dive deep into kind of two of these. I'll really kind of focus on some of the sensing related things since I think that they have a lot of um, application to a lot of the things people are working on in the Robotics Institute. And then uh, some of the locomotion uh, side of things as well. And so I'll talk a little bit about kind of all aspects of this, kind of how we make these systems, uh, some of the results, how we integrate them into larger scale systems, and, and maybe even some of the modeling um, as well, if I have time. Um, so I'm going to start off by, by focusing on the uh, sensing side of things. And then I'll take a little break and, and you guys can ask some questions before I dive into the kind of small scale legged systems out of things. All right, so interestingly, when I first started looking at, you know, using microsystems for sensors on robots, if you go back into the literature of this, it is a who's who of both robotics and microsystems. Everybody has worked on this at some point. So I felt OK joining the gang, basically. Um, and there are a lot of papers on this. There are a lot of sensors that people have done for the idea of like tactile or force or pressure sensing. Um, it's just all over the place. What people haven't done and what I really wanted to think about is, yes, I can make giant arrays of sensors but how does my robot actually understand that information? Or how can I handle that amount of information coming into my robot? Um, and so I wanted to make tactile systems or sensing systems. Um, so I looked at all this stuff. And of course, you know, I really want to make tactile systems. So I started by making a sensor. Right? This is the natural thing to do. Everybody starts by making a sensor. Um, and so in this case, we were looking at the idea of this capacitive transduction for sensors. And so for those of you who have forgotten your freshman physics, 
A capacitor is just kind of two conducting electrodes, right, with a dielectric in between. If I make these out of soft materials, so imagine I have a conductive elastomeric material and a dielectric elastomeric material, if I squish it, that capacitance is going to change. Right? And so that's all this slide is basically trying to emphasize. Now, the benefit I get from using the soft materials is I can get very high strains. Right? I have a low modulus, and I can get very high strains. Microfabrication gets me a benefit because I can get small gaps. Right? And small gaps enable both high aerial density of sensors. I can get a lot of sensors in, in one uh, amount of space, but it also increases my sensitivity. Right? So it increases the change in capacitance that I ultimately get, which all of these things together mean large dynamic range sensors. Right? And that's something traditionally that biology does extremely well, and we as engineers do not do as well. And so that was the basic idea of this. Um, the, some of the early work in this was led by Alexei Harlambidis, who ended up doing a postdoc here and has now started a company in the Pittsburgh area uh, with Carmel Majidi. Um, and that just showed you, OK, I can squish and deform this capacitor. Ultimately, for things like tactile systems, right? if I'm kind of picking up this thing, I'm interested in both normal forces, right, how, how hard I'm grasping it, but also kind of shear forces that are around here. So, you know, what kind of force directions are moving around? So we came up with this general architecture for how we wanted to design these sensors. And so it basically has this kind of middle section, right, and that defines capacitance to these side electrodes here. So I have CA and CB. So if I squish it down, I just apply a normal pressure to this, those capacitances are going to change the same way. If I shear it, right, I'm going to get a differential between those capacitances. And ultimately, right, this is designed so that I have this in three dimensions, so I can get these three axes of uh, sensing. All right, so we did men's things. We went in the clean room and, you know, we liked it, right? Spending time in the clean room is exhausting for those of you who may have had the uh, pleasure of doing it. Right? And so we came up with this nice process where we'd create this kind of mold in silicon. So this was a silicon mold. The benefit being that we'd get these small features that were providing those gaps, right, which is what we cared about. Uh, we basically coat the thing in Teflon, then we uh, mold in a conductive elastomer, peel it out uh, with a dielectric on top, and then refill everything with a dielectric elastomer. All right, so PDMS is just a, a rubber, basically a silicone rubber. The gray is silicon. People can get those confused, but this is Silicon Valley, and this is silicone uh, uh, rubber. So we can make these uh, small sensors, and we can make them with this, and they work reasonably well. Um, but Alexi, of course, was like, that's a lot of work. I don't want to do that again. Um, so how can I simplify this process? Uh, so he went to uh, the idea that really the only small feature I care about in this device is this gap right here, right? And so if I can use a process where I can basically leave that gap behind, if I have something that's repeatable enough that I can leave a, say, 20 or 30 micron gap behind, I can still make these sensors. And so that's exactly what he did. He basically now is using milling to do the same thing. It gets us larger aspect ratios, which ultimately end up with better sensors as well. Um, and so now you basically do the same kind of molding process and you can reuse the molds as well to create um, sensors that look like this. And so you can create large arrays. One of the other benefits is you can create them over larger areas than your four inch silicon wafer that you might have in the clean room. Um, but you can still get the kind of sensitivity that you might care about. So one of the other things that uh, we realized late in the, later in the process is that you know, capacitive is wonderful. We get a lot of sensitivity from this capacitive transduction. It's fairly low noise. Um, but you don't always need that, right? And I think one of the, the things I've pulled from biology and talking to biologists along the way is biology is good enough, right? It, it does what it needs to do, and it doesn't do a lot more than that. Right? I think in some sense we overdesign uh, a lot of our, our sensors and we don't necessarily need to for certain applications. So this came out of discussions actually with Hugh Herr who was interested in potentially putting these inside a prosthetic socket just to know like am I putting forces on this that I shouldn't be, I'm putting forces on the person that I shouldn't be through my prosthetic. Um, and so we came up with the idea well, 
you don't even need to bother with adding the final uh, kind of coating of elastomer. You can use this contact resistance uh, approach. So now I don't have the extra elastomer. I squish it down. I'm going to touch those pads on either side, or I shear it and I touch one and I don't touch the other. So it's crude. It's not going to give you a lot of information or a lot of bits of information, but it might give you a good enough uh, kind of amount of information. So we tested both. All right, and it's also really simple from a systems integration standpoint, I should add. I just need to add some pull-up resistors, and boom, it's, it's good to go. It's very easy and, and simple. So we tested both. All right, so what I'm looking at here is the top case. I'm just adding a, a normal force to this. And as expected, in this case, that's a, a, a decrease in voltage on the... Um, on the uh, y-axis for the contact resistance here. Um, and so everything goes up, right? So I'm pushing down, all the pads are affected approximately equally. And then if I shear it in a particular direction, only that pad is basically sensitive to it. The capacitance looks beautiful, right? It's repeatable, it's not so noisy. Um, you know, it does exactly the same kind of things that I expect. So for example, if I'm shearing in this direction toward V3, I'm going to get an increase in capacitance on V3 and a decrease in V2 here, right? And V1 is gonna stay about the same. So I can get some pretty uh, nice dynamic ranges. So normal forces, I'm looking at, I think 10 newtons is the highest we tested with, but I think you could certainly go higher than that. Um, and about 100 millinewton resolution with the device that we designed. Um, shear, I'm also getting kind of similar type of resolutions and the, the range limitation on that is just that you slip. Um, and contact resistance was, you know, not that great, but in some cases good enough. If all I care is that there's shear force here, Right, this might be good enough for me. And so this was kind of interesting results for us and started kind of building larger arrays of these. So this is just, he made one in the size, shape of a hand because I guess that's fun, right? And you know, just started kind of pushing on this to show that you could get different uh, signals at different locations along the hand. Um, you can do the same thing with the shear. In this case, he was taking a, an acrylic block and, and shearing it across. Um, so you can see the direction that that shear is occurring in um, for these sensors as well. So now he's shearing it in the different direction. And you can actually integrate this onto grippers and, and do sort of fun things. But this is still a bunch of sensors, right? And ultimately I said, we're interested in systems. And this is also pretty painful. Like you look at all those electrical leads coming out, that's kind of freaky if you're a student and you have to wire that up. Um, looks good to me though. So, so we started thinking about this kind of larger scale systems integration problem of how we actually put this on a robot. And this is work with uh, Rashab Agarwal, who is a master's student um, at Maryland working on this. And so basically, you know, tried a couple different uh, uh, grippers, um, you know, just kind of off the shelf grippers. Uh, and, and put our sensor on those grippers, designed a ROS interface for the sensor. Uh, so basically the sensor was talking to an Arduino, which was then talking to ROS, which would then uh, talk to the gripper based on that. And so we started doing some, some basic tests with this. And one of the things we wanted to look at was this kind of shear uh, type stuff. So in this case, the robot, this is just a KUKA arm, is grasping uh, effectively a water bottle here. Um, picks it up and then it's then kind of going back and forth like this with it, right? So you want to kind of grasp it with the right amount of force and be able to tell what direction that gravity vector is pointing you in, like how the, the object is oriented in the grasp. And so there's the, the water bottle, just kind of highlight it and, and how it's oriented with the gripper. And so what you can see is that you can actually kind of pick up this information pretty easily um, from the sensor. And so you could actually potentially do some fun uh, manipulation type things, um, which is not what I do, but it would be uh, fun to partner with somebody who's interested in that kind of stuff. So this was just fun to see this actually integrated into a system. This was one sensor. Ultimately, we're interested in doing this with a lot of sensors. Right, and so we took a step back, and this is a kind of a, a, a slightly different version of this. Uh, we're thinking about what other sensors can we make using this basic approach, and so this uh, came from a collaboration that started um, with some folks at the University of Washington and Tom Daniels' lab there. And, and Tom works on moths, this Manduka sexta moth. Um, it's a pretty big moth for those who haven't seen it. Um, and one of the crazy cool things, I mean, there's a lot of really interesting things about uh, this moth, 
But one of the interesting things from my perspective is that if you look at the wings of this moth, right, there are actually a bunch of strain sensors across the wing. There's a lot at the base as well, but there's a lot of strain sensors across the wing, and these are campaniform sensilla. And one of the interesting things, or the hypotheses on this, is that these mechanosensors, these sensors that are sensing strain, give you a much faster response than the visual system of the moth. Math has all sorts of different sensory systems, chemosensory, vision, uh, mechanosensory, right? But these give you particularly fast responses. And one of the hypotheses is that the moth is able to use this, in some sense, to do very fast control when there are gusts um, uh, around or disturbances. So these disturbances might affect the wing and deform the wing well before the actual uh, body starts moving. And you could tell that um, from an inertial sensor, for example, on the body. So, so this was the hypothesis. And we wanted to actually see if we could design some physical models and some sensors to actually uh, look into this. And so, so we did the same basic thing. In this case, uh, we're looking at strain sensors instead of these force sensors. It's still capacitive in nature. And I should mention, one of the reasons we go with capacitive transduction is if uh, you just look at these uh, conductive elastomers, and these are all over the place in the literature, people just add some carbon nanotubes or some kind of uh, carbon black or silver particles to an elastomer, you stretch it, the resistance is going to go up. Depending on how you made it, you can let go, and eight hours later, the resistance might not be back at its nominal resistance. So there can be a lot of hysteresis in these sensors. So capacitance, you're limited, you still have hysteresis from the polymer, but you really have mostly just the hysteresis in that polymer. So this is one of the reasons we, we think a lot about uh, capacitive transduction. So the basic idea here is now I have these interdigitated comb fingers. Right? So it's still just a, a capacitor deforming, but now I have kind of two modes that I'm going to think about this in. One is I'm stretching it this way, kind of along the combs, right? Um, and the other way is I'm going to stretch it this way, right? I'm going to pull in this direction, uh, transverse to the combs. Right? And I get the same benefits that I did for the other sensor. The small gaps give me very high sensitivity, and I get large range uh, out of stretching it with the soft material. And so this is, uh, I should mention, this is work by uh, Hesop Shin. Um, and this, uh, so you can make sensors with this. This is great. You can make small sensors. Uh, they, they are stretchy, and they're soft, and conformal, and wonderful. Uh, the thing I want to get you to get out of this slide, well, first of all, this kind of first order model is terrible, right? The blue line does not look like the red line. Um, this is a dynamic test, and one of the things that you see is actually, you know, especially at reasonable rates, you have very little hysteresis in this system. Right? As you start going faster, especially for this one, for some reason, you start seeing more. But certainly for that top one, it looks great. Um, but really, the thing I want you to get out of this is this very high dynamic range. So I can detect kind of a 100 microstrain, and I think uh, he's tested it to 50% strain. You could probably go further with these materials. Right? So you actually get some pretty decent uh, dynamic range out of these. He's then decided he wanted the blue line to match the red line, so he went on and made better models of this as well. Um, but that's a, a whole other talk. And this gives you some sense as to when you put it on a uh, wing, we were looking at fixed wing aircraft, because that's what our collaborator at Colorado, Sean Humbert, was working on. So now you can see as I kind of deflect the wing, I can see these changes in capacitance um, from the sensor. And one of the fun things is when he lets go right here, you'll see the ring down, so it's fast enough that you can actually capture um, some of those dynamics. But that's, once again, one sensor and not integrated into a full system. So that has probably been the bane of HESOP's existence for the last couple years, um, is trying to do this. Right? And so this is 14 sensors on each wing. So it basically comes out as a skin, effectively, that you then laminate onto the wing. Um, there's a, a little kind of uh, flex PCB uh, there that can kind of integrate and forward on the information to the autopilot. Right, um, through, a, through a teensy there, the Pixhawk is the autopilot. Uh, and the basic idea from this, this iteration of it was just, you know, make sure it works and just trying to see what kind of data we can collect um, from this uh, type of setup. And so, 
We started by just doing some benchtop tests. So this is like, let's see what a gust looks like on this thing. So what you're looking at here is a, uh, a leaf blower, basically, um, uh, pushing on the wing. And so you can see strain on the wing. Now there's no uh, gust. Now he's going to add another gust. And you can see uh, some of that strain. The sensors are pretty noisy. Um, sample rate was not fantastic from the array. And so we actually have a new version in the works um, to fix both of those problems. But it gives you a sense of how it would work. Um, you can also look at ring down. So this is picking four of these sensors to monitor here. And you can see that we can actually uh, capture the deflection um, of the wing as it's doing its ring down. So we can capture that kind of first mode of the dynamics. And so this is pretty exciting. We can actually get data from these. So let's put it on a plane and fly it, because that is fun to do. So this is, once again, our, our collaboration with the Humbert Group in Colorado because they can fly things really easily. And at the time in DC, you certainly couldn't fly things because you'd have the Secret Service on your butt if you did that. Um, I don't know what it's like in Pittsburgh if you fly things yet. But um, in this case, what you'll see is if the plane flies over, you can actually see the sensor array under the wings right there. Um, so it's actually capturing data as it's flying around, um, which was super exciting to actually get that data. Um, even more exciting was the idea that I could take data from some sensors and actually pull out some of the inertial information from that. So in this case, I'm looking at just Z acceleration, kind of a heave in flight, and I can actually see that data from my sensors. So um, this line, the purple is the IMU data, um, the blue is the left wing, and the red is the right wing. If I sum those data, if I kind of spatially integrate across the wing, which is another benefit of having a lot of sensors, I get much cleaner data, basically, is what that's saying. Right? But I can pull that kind of data out of this array of strain sensors, which you wouldn't think strain sensors would give you acceleration, but um, you can actually get some pretty good data from that. All right, so, so this is kind of uh, uh, one example of this kind of full system integrated of a lot of uh, sensors, or at least you know somewhat large number of sensors, 28 sensors in this case. Um, we've also done some other kind of just random fun things with sensors, uh, especially in regards to flight and these strain sensors. So this was, the idea behind this was, this was an undergraduate, this is Sam Golub. Um, the idea was, as I'm flying close to the ground, actually, I should tell you the story that this came from. So this came from talking to some biologists at uh, a meeting related to this grant. And they were telling me about an experiment that they did. And we have biologists in the audience. And biologists do weird experiments. Am I correct? Like, they do some funny things. In this case, they stuck a mosquito in a clear acrylic box or a glass box and just let it fly around and watch what happened, right? And so the mosquito never ran into the walls, like, first of all, and they were kind of surprised by this. And they were like, well, how does it actually do this? And one of their hypotheses was that the mosquito can actually detect the ground effect. So as it gets close to a surface, it can actually measure that kind of reverberating thrust from the surface. And so the idea behind this was like, oh, let's stick some sensors on a quad rotor and see if we can do the same thing. We're certainly generating a lot of thrust that, that might rebound from the surface. And so this is a very simple sensor. It's kind of that same contact resistance approach. So basically, as I get close to the ground, this thing's going to start waving wildly right here. And that's all those spikes that you see. And you know, working with enough uh, neuroscientists, I think, recently has got me thinking, looking at that plot and thinking, oh, it looks kind of like a spike density. Right? It looks like a spike profile from a, from a neuron or something. So as I get closer, that increases, starts going faster. And as I go further away, I get fewer spikes. Right? So this might actually be kind of a really simple, easy way of getting information um, from these sensors with very simple hardware. And so this was the kind of idea behind this. Um, and this is kind of a project that's, that's ongoing. Another kind of fun thing that we were interested in doing is uh, more on the human interaction side. And so this came from another student in the lab, uh, Louis Dankovich, who's actually still at Maryland. And the idea was, well, can I put a bunch of these strain sensors on my arm? And then as I'm doing different gestures and you know, hand motions, can I pick that up from the strain sensors? Well, this was one of those happy accidents where we were getting far more signal just from the wires than from the sensor itself. And so we were like, well, screw the sensor. Well, let's just lose copper electrodes there. Um, and so 
This is uh, Lewis with his uh, little armband. There's seven electrodes, and you're just looking at kind of capacitance. So if you kind of are moving your hand, you can see uh, the different muscles moving there. And you can actually pick this up really easily um, with a very, very simple band. And so this is kind of interesting from a human-robot interaction standpoint. And uh, obviously, you can throw some nice machine learning at this. And in this, his case, he classified, I think, 32 different uh, hand motions and gestures uh, from this, these seven streams of data um, and did that extremely well. Um, so it was great for, for individuals, but didn't necessarily uh, go across individuals, I think, in part because the bands are spaced equally for everybody. So this is kind of some, uh, some fun sensing things. We also have fun sensing things with whiskers. We work with Mitra Hartman at Northwestern who does rats and they kind of run around and fascinating kind of tactile sensors. But I wanted to take this opportunity um, to kind of pause before I get into the locomotion side of things, see if there's any uh, kind of questions on the sensing um, side of this work before you forget them. Yeah. So you mentioned that you can infer uh, I mean, yeah, so part of the idea on the control side, and this is what uh, Sean Humbert is primarily working on, is that um, I'm not necessarily going to be looking just to get inertial data. I can get that from my IMU. The more interesting thing is if I see that deflection happening, can I wrap a faster control loop just around some of those initial strain uh, measurements and actually respond to a gust? So imagine just a feed forward controlled path that would respond to a gust before the inertial sensor ever detects something is amiss, basically. Um, so yeah, that's the idea around that. Other questions? Yeah, Greg. Mm -hmm. in, in the beginning of the talk. Um, Compatiform sensilla have a delay yeah. when the strain is applied and when they can get the message back to the nervous system. What's your delay relative to Compatiform sensilla? Are you a lot faster or just a little bit faster or about the same speed? So this is a good question. Um, so there's actually a lot of interesting things going on with these campaniform sensilla, and this is actually informing some of the future work. So the delay for those is on the order of 10 milliseconds, maybe a little bit more. Um, in our case, I think in the newest uh, iteration of that strain sensor array, we're at something like 40 hertz. So, you know, not exactly, but on the right order of magnitude in terms of kind of response there. Um, and that's for querying the entire array. One of the interesting things about the biological sensors, and I think this is fascinating for a lot of people interested in um, kind of AI type things in this, in this audience, is they actually have a neural filter attached to them. So, so basically what they found out is that that neuron will only spike if it sees a particular pattern of strain applied um, to, the, to the sensor. And that's fascinating to me, because if I kind of take a step back and look at the last 10 years of my career, a lot of it has been like, let's push all the intelligence to the hardware to some degree, or push a lot of the intelligence to the hardware, because if you work on small robots, it's really hard to add all the computing resources that a lot of you play with on a, on a daily basis. And so the interesting thing from that is that I'm only getting data when I care about that data. So say that strain sensor, strain signal is related to a gust is happening, right? I have the right frequency that would correspond to a gust. I get data then, and I don't get data otherwise. So it, in some sense, makes the kind of central computation much easier. And so there's a lot of kind of interesting things you can think about designing that into the electronics or even the hardware of the sensor, that same kind of filtering um, idea. So that's kind of par part of what's driving this work forward. Yeah. Yeah, so actually what we're doing now for that, uh, for that wing skin is it's a little more modular now. And so you actually have an embedded microcontroller like at the sensors. So, you could, so the benefit for us kind of in this work going forward is that you can play with, do I do something with the data before I send it along or do I just collect the data and send it along, right? And so I can actually 
play with some of those trade-offs as to what data I actually care about. I can do some local processing, basically, on that data. Um, and so that makes it a little more uh, modular and easier to use in a lot of different systems as well. Did that answer your question, Gabe? All right. All right, so I'm going to move on to uh, some of the, the mobile-legged uh, robots. So this is kind of a fun, this is, I mean, if I think about uh, what always gets me up in the morning and interested, like, it's small-scale motion, right? It's things that move around are just, for me, incredibly fun. Um, and so this is one of my favorites. Um, I think just kind of, you've all seen insects move around, uh, but just to remind you of what insects can do. So this is uh, from Bob Foles' lab at Berkeley. This is a cockroach running over effectively these little Lego blocks, and it's doing this very fast, and it's doing this without tipping over, right? If you imagine your big robots trying to do that, it, they might have some trouble there. What can tiny robots do? Um, so this is some data that we collected uh, for a review article not too long ago. And basically what you're looking at here is all of the white circles indicate um, uh, robots here. And these indicate if they have any kind of power on board even, like some of them don't have any power or most of them don't have any power, if they have any onboard control and if they have any onboard sensing, some of the things that we would imagine are useful for autonomy. Right? And this dashed line here represents one gram. So if you go above a gram, you actually get some robots that have some level of autonomy to them. If you go below a gram, Mm, not so much, right? Uh, so this is uh, the little kind of micro rocket robot that I was talking about earlier. This is a kind of small little electrostatic thing. It's basically a capacitor and a tiny little chip. Um, so it's on the hairy edge of, of uh, workable, basically. But the vast majority of the things out there, no autonomy, right? So we're not even kind of at the point of thinking about that. Well, I think we're starting to get to the point of thinking about that, but we haven't been thus far. Right. If we look at things like speed, like where is kind of the existing state of the art in, in small scale robots. So here's that one gram line right here. Right, You have a lot of robots, so Rex over here, um, about 10 kilograms, I sprawl, dash, hammer, roach, like these are all kind of robots that people might be familiar with. There's the uh, cockroach um, right there. And then below a gram, like, eh, there's a couple robots here. They don't move very fast. So this is in body lengths per second. So cockroach, say, around 10 body lengths per second. This ant is really booking at um, almost 18 body lengths per second. The green circles are all insects, right? And they can all move pretty quickly. And our robots typically are down here, right? They don't, they move if we're lucky kind of thing. Right, and so, so this is something that really gets interesting to us. Right? We're engineers, we like things that we can measure and things that can go fast. Um, and so we'd like to have things that can actually move a decent distance in a given period of time, especially if I'm really tiny. Right? I don't want it to take all day to cross the table. Another big challenge if you're small, right? step height. Um, just the fact that everything around you, the carpet now looks uh, pretty chaotic and all over the place, like the little mini Himalayas for you. So some existing robots that people have made, this one I'll show you in a second, might get tripped up over a piece of pollen in its path. Um, this one certainly, well, probably pollen would get it too, but certainly hair. And this guy needs a perfectly clean sur substrate to actually move around, right? So E. coli would, would flummox it effectively. So this is actually, you know, we want things that can not only move at reasonable speeds, but can get around, right? That can encounter the environments that we have, uh, that we encounter on a daily basis. And then finally, efficiency, right? This is always a big question for small robots is power and energy storage, and how can I effectively use that? So this plot is, is a little messy, but the, the circles are robots and the squares are are insects. And what I'm looking at is the energy it takes to move a meter in joules. So most of my insects are down here around 10 millijoules, maybe a millijoule of energy it takes them to move a meter. And this comes from actual measurements of basically running ants on a treadmill inside a box and measuring oxygen consumption. Um, and then my, my uh, robots are typically, you know, a uh, hundred joules for a tiny little robot uh, to move that uh, kind of mass. 
All, most of these use a particular transduction method. Right, so it gives you some sense as to the difference between existing robots and, and what insects can actually do. The other thing I'll point out in, in efficiency is it's extremely dependent on implementation, right? What actuators you choose to use, how, how they actually work, right? Han Asimo takes about a horsepower to, to walk on a flat surface at a meter per second. You know, old robot from Steve Collins and Andy Ruina takes about 12 and a half watts, and I'm sure you can do far better than that um, uh, these days as well. So it's, it's incredibly implementation dependent, so it's hard to actually get a common metric. There's things like cost of transport, but those have problems as well. So we just kind of look at at least kind of the difference in what that gap is uh, that we have to overcome. All right, and then, so those are like some of the technical challenges of, of, you know, the white space of where we want to go versus where we're at. There's also really interesting scientific challenges here as well. And so if I think about how a cockroach uh, moves around, so uh, cockroach has inspired a lot of different robots at larger scales, right? But I can all simplify it to this basic model of a, a mass on a springy leg. So this spring-loaded inverted pendulum or slip model, um, which I always thought was an unfortunately titled model given that slip is an important thing in locomotion as in I slip on a banana peel kind of thing. Um, but anyway, one of our big questions is how that scales down. Because, right? you know, no longer when I'm tiny do I have enough mass to really compress springs, for example. Now I have adhesion with the ground that I need to pay attention to that's on the same order of magnitude as my inertial forces. And so even if it does, like, hold on, what are the, the, one of the big questions is how I can engineer my system to take advantage of that at this small scale without a lot of computational and sensing resources. Can I actually push that into the passive dynamics um, of my robot? So that's one of the things that we're interested in as well. So to give you a sense of how hard it is to make robots uh, at this size scale, this is actually something that I worked on as a graduate student many years ago at Berkeley. And I noticed it's even Berkeley colors with the light. So this blue here is solar cells. Uh, and this gold here is a CMOS controller. So this actually had controller and power. Um, and then basically the robot all along here, this is motor. This is all electrostatic motor, electrostatic motor. And it's got these tiny little legs um, at the end. This is effectively a roll cage to protect the legs because the legs would get ripped off um, very easily. Um, and so this is something that took about two months in the clean room to make, uh, maybe an extra month to actually try to get all the chips bonded together. Um, and this is actually what it did. Um, so the little shiny things, these are hinge joints, little pin joints, um, you know, two micron cross-section pins um, right there. And what you are watching right now are micro-robot calisthenics. Um, this robot is effectively doing push-ups. It's not actually able to pull itself forward, um, which, you know, was in some sense cool. It was doing those with solar power. That's kind of fun. Um, and if you watched it long enough, so if you let this go for about eight minutes, it shuffles to the right a little bit, which meant Seth Holler declared victory, wrote his dissertation, and was done. Um, but we'd obviously like to improve on that. So one of the things when I first started as a faculty member, I'm like, screw these pin joints, right? They're really a pain in the butt. Um, let's start looking at some soft materials to provide the same basic idea. And in this case, we have this embedded elastomer in here. I can create little flexure joints now. I can store energy because one of the things I haven't really talked about yet is I was always fascinated by jumping things. Um, so I can store energy like in a spring um, and release that energy to jump. And so this enabled a lot of different things once we could add these kind of soft materials, expand effectively the materials toolbox that we had to work with at this scale. So this was worked by Aaron Garrett uh, quite a while ago. Um, as a short aside, I know I'm talking mostly about kind of running and legged things, uh, we decided to test this little jumping mechanism. And so you can get a sense of the energy that I can store in the springs of this. So this is just a jumping mechanism. It doesn't have any power uh, or actuators on board. But we wanted to see if I could store enough energy to get a decent jump out of it. And this is actuated using a method in the lab that's very popular called graduate student with tweezers. Um, and so we actually 
uh, Aaron actually compresses this little thing and then releases it with the tweezers uh, in order to jump. And so what you'll see uh, on the next slide is a black fuzzy dot flying through the air, which is this kind of approximately three to four millimeter uh, piece of silicon um, flying through the air. And so there's Aaron with the tweezers in question, um, and there's the black fuzzy dot uh, flying in the air. One of the cool things, it's incredibly robust, so you wouldn't want to drop most robots from this height, uh, but at smaller scales, you get some benefits on that front. Um, and it, what's that? How much does the whole robot weigh? Uh, this was about eight milligrams, I think. It was actually pretty big in this case. Uh, it didn't need to be, but it was pretty big. So it actually works pretty well until, of course, we lose it because it's very tiny. Um, and we had a lot of them in the lab. Uh, so we wanted to move beyond this and start looking a little bit at legs and actuation. And so this was Dana Votman's uh, PhD work. And in this case, we decided to cheat to some degree. Um, so we separately work on actuators, and I'll talk a little bit at that, about that at the very end. But we wanted to look at locomotion separate from having to integrate all of those parts together. And so in this case, there's a magnet embedded in this, and it's controlled by an external field. You can see that uh, silicone joint in there. Um, and this forms part of a leg, effectively. So in this case, I have a knee, I have a hip, right? And I'm driving one of my, uh, uh, one of my links, and the other is, is passive in this case. Right? I can create, I have a symmetric uh, magnetic field, which is just going to move back and forth, or actually rotates. Um, and I create asymmetry by adding this kneecap and a foot, right? So my, my leg can push forward, but then it will bend and, and move um, back to reset. And so I can get forward motion with that. And so this is the basic idea. So I can insert magnets with different orientations to have the legs move differently based on a particularly applied field. And I basically, in this case, we were using a, a permanent magnet underneath this, which adds a torque on those leg magnets. It also adds a downward force due to a gradient, but you can think about that as a payload um, on the robot. So this is it in motion. This is at uh, 500 frames per second. So it, it, it moves actually pretty quickly when you uh, look at it uh, in, in real time. But you can actually see it moving here. There's actually a gimpy leg in the back that's flopping around a little bit. Um, but it still actually moves quite well. So uh, we changed the frequency. Effectively, this is a stride frequency of the robot along the x-axis and look at the speed. And so we're getting about five body lengths per second or so once we get um, to around this 20 hertz uh, stride frequency um, in this system. And so this was actually quite successful in terms of legged robots. It, it did quite well on that speed plot that I showed you earlier, because um, most robots at this point were at kind of body length per second or less um, there as well. So we took a step back and thought, well, well we want to use 3D printing too, right? We want to get out of the clean room on this side of the process. And so started uh, printing these larger scale robots. And you can get the same idea. It looks like a little mini quadruped version of a Rex, basically. Um, and same idea, providing this torque from an external magnetic field. So here it is uh, running. It's actually running on an acrylic plate. It's not running on that red thing. So it's just an unfortunate camera angle. Um, and you can see it running on the same kind of surface that I showed you that cockroach uh, running on earlier. But it gets stuck a lot. It's not that fast. It slips. It's not the best. Uh, so we wanted to actually take a step back and realize we need compliance in our legs. We need our legs to have some springiness. And so we came up with a new process to 3D print most everything, but we mold the legs um, and uh, insert those into the robot. And now we have legs with different compliances. And so this is a little spaghetti plot of uh, impedance as well as damping in the leg. Because our hypothesis going into this is that damping actually matters quite a lot too in being able to provide some stability to your locomotion. And so this kind of blue line right here is a cockroach uh, leg to give you some point of comparison. Um, I'm going to ignore the black and the green line. So the green was a foam that basically just wrapped around the axle and served as a wheel, which was a kind of nice reference for us. Um, but the black was a, a 3D printed uh, viscoelastic material, which was extremely highly damped, um, so through measurements quite off. But I'll look at these two elastomers. So we have kind of what we call, MR, it's the brand name is MRTV. It's still a silicone. But you can get an idea of compliance relative to that uh, robot. And it has a little bit more damping as well. 
And then normal Silgard 184 is another silicone, slightly stiffer, but more resilient, less damping in the material. All right, so we start looking at speed versus uh, leg type. So this is a rigid leg, it does okay. This is the Tango Black, which is that highly viscoelastic. It looks pretty much like the rigid leg, not surprisingly. Then you get to the PDMS, and ooh, it actually looks pretty good. Like, I'm doing pretty well there. Um, the foam is basically our wheel. It's kind of linear, as we would expect. And then, whoa, like that MRTV, like something happened there and bumped us way up. And so this was actually really interesting data to get. Um, if you look at it a little more closely, right, you have uh, the MRTV does better almost on every count versus uh, the other materials. And part of our hypothesis there was that damping actually mattered. So to give you a sense of what this looks like in real time, this was one of the, the high speed runs. So this is running at about 12 body lengths per second at 19.2 hertz uh, stride frequency. The whole robot with the magnetic payload is about a gram. So the robot without the payload is about 750 milligrams. Right? So it can move, it can book, it can go pretty fast. So we took a step back to really try to see what we're doing. This is a collaboration with Jonathan Clark and Wei Gao at Florida State and looked at some modeling to figure out how much damping was actually contributing to this. And if you look at kind of a, a, a relative stiffness on, on the x-axis and damping ratio on the y-axis, uh, you can get, this is Ford number, which is a, a measure of velocity, kind of a non-dimensional number for, for speed. Right? I can get really high speeds for low damping, not surprisingly. Right? I have a lot of compliance, not much energy dissipated. I'm going to do pretty well in speed. Um, most of where we were working at was in this kind of red range here. I can do a lot of different things in that red range. So separately, though, if I look at the stability, if I look at eigenvalue of this, this locomotion, right, if I'm in that high speed regime, I'm effectively at the edge of stability, right? I, if, if something, if I get a perturbation, I'm not going to be able to recover, basically. If I'm in this regime, I'm actually really nice and stable, right? So I can't run quite as fast, but I can run stably, which for me, if I don't have a lot of computation resources to control, way better for me in the end, right? And it turns out there's some nice regions that I might be able to kind of get benefit on both ends if I design my damping and my uh, compliance just right in the leg. So this is really kind of exciting for us that I can actually, the basic idea from this and the takeaway is that I can choose the material of my leg to actually run in a stable manner very quickly without, in a basically feed forward fashion. Right? I don't need all these control resources uh, to wrap around and, and stabilize my locomotion. So this was pretty exciting for us. I'm interested in tiny things and we wanted to go smaller. So this is about as small as I can 3D print on most systems, but we wanted to go smaller than that. And so we started using a new fabrication method, uh, two photon polymerization using some, a tool called the NanoScribe. And in this case, we can print really, really tiny robots. In some sense defined by the smallest magnets we could buy off the shelf. Um, this gives you a sense of scale. So this is, uh, this is an ant. It happens to be a particularly large ant. Um, it's a bullet ant. Um, this whole thing is two and a half millimeters long and about a milligram in mass. And ants can span a lot of different masses. 10 milligrams is perhaps more typical, right? But it gives you an idea of the size of this thing. Right? And we, in this case, we don't have to use that permanent magnet. We can actually generate with a pure kind of magnetic field, uniform magnetic field. And so we can get a nice torque out of the system. And this is that guy running. Uh, in real time. This is with rigid legs. Everything is kind of printed together. Um, you can see some really interesting motion in that one leg is kind of moving before the other. One set of legs is moving before the other. This is a pronking gate. Um, to give you some sense of scale, like there's Usain Bolt. He's pretty slow in comparison to our robot, right? <laughs> um, so this is a little PowerPoint fun. Um, so we can do the same thing we did at the larger scale and play with materials once again. So this is a, a PDMS legs. We're getting about 24 body lengths per second. We can go to that MRTV and get close to 50 body lengths per second for these tiny robots. All right, and so there's a lot of interesting benefits. We can even run over 
uh, rough terrain. In this case, it's aluminum foil that's been scrunched up uh, to create our mountainous terrain here. But there's the little robot uh, running at you through that uh, terrain. And it can get over it pretty easily. We've measured forces to try to look at uh, if we're in this kind of slip dominated regime or not in the slip dominated regime. And it turns out we're, we're pretty close to that. Um, so we think we are actually getting some slip locomotion even at these small scales, but this is kind of work in progress um, as well. So ultimately we're interested in putting all of this together and actually adding, bumping ourselves up on that autonomy scale and adding some autonomy. <laughs> All right, so this is actually work I wanted to throw in a couple things um, that are more recent. This is Sukjun Kim, who's a PhD student here, and, and Camilo Velez, Dr. Camilo Velez, who's a postdoc, right, and looking at um, basically taking the same 3D printing process at small scales and adding actuators to that by adding metal. And so in this case, we can create these 3D actuators um, that are fairly simple. This is a little flapping mechanism that I, I couldn't find a better video for, but gives you the basic idea. And this is a more recent uh, example uh, using actually shape memory alloy, so thin film um, NITI. And so there's the little M moving up and down in the CMU there. Right? But all based on this kind of 3D printing and thin films of metals uh, in there. So I think kind of to sum up, um, since I am out of time, um, I think we're slowly getting closer to these, right? It's a, it's a long process. These things are hard. Hardware is hard for a reason, right? Um, but I think there's a potential big impact. And obviously, I'd like to thank all of the uh, students who are now postdocs uh, or um, have moved on, and my old uh, kind of group picture, and obviously lots of sponsors and talented undergraduates and other grad students who weren't in this as well. So thank you very much for your time on a Friday afternoon. I will leave you with a, a cartoon uh, as well. So thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Happy to answer any questions. <laughs> they know what's going on. Yeah. So when you design those actuators, uh, sensors, mm -hmm. you're trying to use some computational tool or simulation tool to uh, decide what is the best structure or what is the best structure. Yeah, so I didn't get into a lot of the modeling on this. So the question was, do we actually design these things intelligently? Um, so yes, uh, so we do have a lot of models um, for these different sensors. We do a lot of um, analytical where we can, at least kind of first order models are often useful for design, um, but then we can get more complex analytical models, so or numerical models, so the strain sensors, for example, are a fairly complex numerical model, and then FEA when we have to, um, to help us in terms of figuring out what the design map is and to get the kind of responses that we ultimately want for these systems. So, yeah, I mean, we absolutely think about modeling, uh, which I didn't go into the math for this, but I'm happy to talk about it offline as well. Yeah. So when I think of autonomy for robot locomotion, I normally think of like navigation, Mm -hmm. planning and decision making. <laughs> yeah. Is that something that you were even starting to think about at this point? Or when you say autonomy, are you just talking about getting everything on? Yeah, so we kind of defined two steps in autonomy when we were thinking about this. One was just power autonomy, the ability to kind of move on my own. Uh, and then there was, or sorry, three steps. One was just being able to get from A to B. Uh, and then there was the, the more complex autonomy that you're thinking about. Um, so, so I'd say at the kind of Gram on up, so maybe a couple gram scale, people are starting to think about the more navigation level autonomy. So on Hammer, which is a robot out of Rob Wood's lab at Harvard, they are starting to think about this a little bit. I think below a gram, we're still trying to get that kind of move from A to B level of autonomy. Um, but it's a very good question. Yeah. Uh, you did that, uh, that prompt or that push-up robot with the solar panel. Can you did any more work with uh, sort of solar power and yeah, I mean, solar is definitely feasible. So one of the interesting challenges, so the question was, are, are we doing anything more with solar? So one of the interesting challenges with these robots is that the actuation schemes that work, or this kind of transduction methods that work well at this scale, are not what we think of at larger scale. Larger scale, you're thinking of electromagnetic motors, tend to be a lot of current, but lower voltages. Right. Typically, what we're looking at works well at this scale are, say, piezoelectric actuators, like are in, in Hammer, for example, 
or um, electrostatic actuators, both of which require high voltages but very low currents. Right? And so power electronics become an interesting thing right there as well. So the robot I showed you with solar cells actually had 80 solar cells all stacked in series to get the kind of high voltages that you needed um, in order to drive those actuators. Um, so I would absolutely do that again if I could fabricate those solar cells. Um, I think it would be absolutely fun and, and reasonable to do. Um, what we're doing in, you know, in, in parallel to that, or kind of instead of that right now, is, is saying, okay, here's the kind of battery technology we have in front of us. Can we use something like shape memory alloy and thin films of that to still be somewhat efficient, right, but be able to match very easily with the kind of power sources that we have at our disposal? So that's the, that's the kind of other direction that we're going there. Yes? So um, in the graphs that you showed for BDMS and for mm -hmm. you showed the speed versus frequency, yeah. I sort of noticed that there was some sort of resonance, and I'm curious. Yeah, so, so there's a peak. Um, it's, it's not quite resonance, but um, there's definitely a peak. Uh, in these systems, sorry, I'm not as skilled as other people are with this. So you can see both the, the red plot and the, the blue plot, I get um, these kind of peaks. So basically beyond that, uh, I start to go much more unstable. So you can see actually my error bars, or maybe you can't see uh, with this light, the error bars start to grow kind of after that peak as well. Right? And so th things, uh, and the stability, the frequency actually um, affects the, the um, damping ratio of my system as well. So part of it's that, part of it's I, I might not um, track the magnetic field quite as well. Right? There's a lot of different factors that go into that, but it's not just a kind of a mechanical resonance um, in that. But it's a, it's a good observation. And one of the interesting things, if I think of it from a modeling perspective, is that blue peak always happens after the red peak. It doesn't matter what gate I actually use. I'm only showing you trotting gate here. Um, it doesn't matter what gate I use, that blue peak always happens later. And we think that's to some degree I'm switching um, models of locomotion too. I'm going more toward an inverted pendulum model at the higher frequencies um, as well. Yeah, that's a good question. All right, cool. Well, thank you for spending your Friday afternoon.